The following sermon was presented on Sunday, May 15th, 2016 by Pastor Daniel. It is titled Genesis TLDR. For more, please visit gladtidingschurchofgod.com. So this morning's sermon, we are going to be talking about something uh, that uh, if you're not really on the internet, maybe you've never seen uh, seen this before. It's the abbreviation TLDR. TL. Sometimes it's TLDR, sometimes it's TL semicolon DR. The point is, is that it stands for too long, didn't read. <laughs> and it's, it's used to refer to um, something that is, in your opinion, was something in your opinion is too long, and you didn't want to take the time to invest to read it. And uh, have you ever started reading something, and you've realized this is just much too long for my taste, right? That's, that's happened to me before. And in, in today's world, where we don't really take the time to read things for too long, uh, we send each other messages, short little messages. Um, we get most of our information in little bite-sized forms in the form of uh, Wikipedia or YouTube. And I'm very aware that this just could be describing how I get my information. Uh, but nevertheless, I, I don't want to encourage this trend because I do think that we should be reading books and, and, and reading as much as we can, and there's a great value in, in, in learning that way. But I do want to start a sermon series called The Bible TLDR. And it's, a, it's supposed to be a little humorous, that the Bible is too long and I didn't read it. and Because that, quite frankly, is the attitude that a lot of people have. It's much too long. It's, in some places, it's obscure, and I don't understand what these genealogies are all about, and so on and so forth. And so most people just don't read the Bible. But if there's a way that we could give it to them in, in bite-sized ways, in ways that is summarizing the, the key points of the Bible, um, I think that that would be a good thing. And that's what we're going to do starting today. And we're going to begin with uh, the book of Genesis, of course, because it's the first book of the Bible, but it's also one of the largest books of the Bible. I looked it up. According to one source, it, it, the book of Genesis has 32,046 words uh, in it. 32,046 words. Uh, I think it's the second largest book, at least according to, the, to that, reason, to, to that um, uh, place where I found that information. Um, So because of that, we're going to cover the book of Genesis in two sermons. And I know that goes against the whole idea of summarizing it quickly, but there's just so much in the book of Genesis. And we might have to do that with some of the uh, larger books. So we'll begin with the book of Genesis. Like I said, it's the first book of the Bible. It's the first book of the five books of Moses called the Torah. And uh, in Hebrew, it has a Hebrew name. In Hebrew, it is called Bereshit. And that means in the beginning. It comes, that's, that word literally means in the beginning, and that's what the Jewish people have historically called the first book of the Bible. So where did we get the name Genesis from? It comes from the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible called the Septuagint. And when they came up with that translation, they named that book of the Bible Genesis because that's a Greek word that means origins. And so in both names, in the beginning and origins, Obviously, we are supposed to understand that the book of Genesis tells us the origins or the beginning of something, right? And as we know, the book of Genesis begins with the story of creation. But what I'm going to tell you is that the book of Genesis, although it is most known for containing the story of the creation, and that's what the beginning or the origin refers to, I have an idea and I have this feeling that what the book of Genesis is most concerned with is the origin or the beginning of the people of God, the people of Israel. I think that's what really the book is about. And it's added the story of the creation and the other uh, stories found in the early early parts of the book as background information to get us to the origin of the people of God. I think if you think about it, when did the people of Israel receive the book of Genesis? At the very uh, earliest, it would have been Moses, the time of Moses at Mount Sinai and, and, and in that generation. So though they may have known some of these stories, I think for the most part, they were given the book of Genesis to be given the background to, to be confident that they had the right God, that their God was indeed the creator of the universe. In fact, there's another reason as well. 
Um, it, it, if you remember from the, the Torah, it says that the people of Israel, and, and, and the book of Joshua actually, it, it says that the people of Israel went in and took by force the land of Canaan, right? The land of Canaan, the promised land, becomes the land of Israel. And so clearly, and, and, and to this day, there are people who would think that that's unjust. Hey, who are you to take that land? Well, according to Rashi, who is a medieval uh, ra rabbi, uh, one of the great sages of Israel, he said that the story of creation was put first in the Bible to demonstrate that God, the God of Israel, is the owner, is the creator, and the owner of the earth, and he can give that land to whomever he wants, right? And so um, we have in the book of Genesis the story of the origin of the people of God, and even the earlier stories are put there for the purpose of, of laying the groundwork, setting the stage to get to the family of Abraham, to the people of Israel. What I also want to do when it comes to this sermon series, as, as we go through each book, each section of each book, I want to comment on the overall narrative of the Bible. I've mentioned this a few times before, but I, I really believe that the Bible has individual stories, but overall it has one big story, right? And the book of Genesis, because it's the first book of the Bible, informs so much of the whole story. It really sets into motion quite a bit of this story. And so let me summarize in a nutshell the story of the Bible, just so that we have this in our minds as we're moving forward. The story of the Bible is this, that God created human beings in order to be in relationship with them. He wanted to love them. He wanted to bless them. He wanted to have them represent him in the world. However, God wants us to genuinely respond to him in love. He doesn't want robots. He wants us to genuinely respond to him in love. So he gave us free will. However, we used our free will to turn away from him and to go our own way. But sadly, think about this, when you go your own way, when you turn away from God, who is the source of life, the giver of life, that can only end in bad consequences, right? And the worst consequence of turning away from God is death. And this is the conundrum that we, we find ourselves in, that we don't get to live forever, that we, we will all die one day, that human beings are destined to die. But God loves us. Even though we turned away from him, he loves us, and he has a plan to save us, a plan to give us immortality, to give us the life that he originally intended for us, a life free from sin, and to enjoy his kingdom on the earth. So this is the overall story of the Bible. God created us with free will. He loves us. He wants us to respond to him. We turned away from him, but God will use whatever he can, and in particular Jesus, he's going to bring about our restoration, our salvation. So to accomplish this plan, he brought Jesus into the world. Jesus, who is a genuine human being. Jesus, who is a true human, but he lived a sinless life. And he showed us how to properly live for God and how to give up everything for God's sake. Did not Jesus do that? Jesus showed us on the cross how to give up everything for God, right? So he set an example for us. So because of his life, because of his death, because of his resurrection, because of, it, of everything that he is, we too, if we were to follow in his footsteps, we too can be like him, both in terms of our character, who we are, but also in terms of his resurrection and immortality. God will grant us resurrection and immortality when Jesus returns, if we stay faithful to him. So the book of Genesis is an incredible part of this overall story because it establishes the whole story itself. So as we go through each section in the book, I'm going to point out to you the different ways that those parts impact and inform the whole story of the Bible. But for now, let's take a look at the screen. Here is just an outline of Genesis, just so you have an idea of what this book is about. We start with the creation narratives. We, we see the fall of humanity and beyond, the story of the flood and beyond. Then we get the story of Abraham, the story of Isaac, the story of Jacob, and the story of Joseph. Of course, the story of the patriarchs of Israel uh, obviously um, mix and over, overlap with each other, but that is a good way to break it down uh, there. So you feel free to jot that down or come to me after the service if you'd like a, that outline as well. So we're going to begin with the beginning. The first verse, we're going to begin with the creation. It says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the first verse appropriately informs us that God is the creator of the universe. Who is this God, right? He's the creator of the universe. 
And there's a lot of debate today about the origins of the universe. But guess what? The Bible, matter-of-factly, says that God is the creator. It doesn't spend too much time. It doesn't try to apologize for the, this belief that God is the creator and that he, did, he created the universe in six days. And again, that doesn't necessarily mean, and we've discussed this before, the fact that the Bible says that God created the, the, the universe and the world in six days doesn't mean that every Christian uh, necessarily believes in that literally. However, we can take this truth away from the early chapters of Genesis, that God is the supreme creator, right? Now, that's obvious to us. We don't think about it. You know, we don't have other gods necessarily competing for our interests. But remember, when the people of Israel were given this book, they still believed in, in, all their, in other gods, so-called gods. And so for them, they needed to be told that there is only one supreme creator God, that there's only one true God, right? And so the creation narratives were given to Israel to establish that Israel's God is the only true God, and he's the creator of everything, right? Let's think about that. As we're going through each section of the book, why this is what I'm doing when I'm writing these sermons, is why was this put there? For what purpose was this put? In, in the Bible. And I think the main reason why the creation narratives are there is to tell everyone, but especially Israel, that, that their God is the only true God and he's the creator. But look at the last verse of the first chapter. So Genesis chapter 1, 31 says, God saw all that he had made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. So when God created what, when God created the universe, when God created the world, it was exactly what he wanted it, right? What he wanted it to be. It was good. It was very good, he said, right? And so this helps inform, this, how does this help inform the overall story of the Bible? It helps inform the story of the Bible because it tells us that what God created originally was good and was exactly what he wanted. And that tells us that it takes human beings with free will to come in and mess things up, Right? It's not God. We, I, I, I will say this over and over until, we, until every single one of us gets it so well in our heads. That God is not the source of evil and pain and suffering. That it's human beings, it's other created creatures with free will that causes he, evil, pain, and suffering. So, we must take away that God created everything good and it was human beings with free will that came in and messed that up. But it also tells, tells us this. Look what it says. And there was evening... And there was morning the sixth day, evening and morning. And this is the biblical model or order of a 24-hour day. That we tend to think that the next the, a 24-hour day starts at midnight and goes until the, the following midnight. Not so to the Jewish people in the Bible and, to, and the Jewish people today. That the day, the 24-hour period begins in the evening and ends the following evening. And this informs what we find at the beginning of chapter 2. We learn about the Sabbath. After the six days of creation, the Bible says this about the seventh day, that seventh day of the creation week. It says, God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work of creating, which God had done. Uh, I'm so used to saying it on Friday nights. That's, that's what came to my mind. Let me say it this way. God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. So the seventh day of the week, which when does the seventh day of the week occur? If you look at some calendars, you might think Sunday is the seventh day of the week. But biblically, we, we're talking about what's in the Bible. Biblically, the seventh day of the week begins Friday night and it ends Saturday evening. So it's Friday night corresponds to our Friday night and Saturday during the day. And so what is the purpose of keeping the Sabbath? Again, how does this inform the story of the Bible? This verse here over informs the commandment that was later given to the people of Israel. That they were to keep the Sabbath. Why? Because it's a memorial of creation. It's also a memorial of the exodus from Egypt. But it's firstly a memorial of creation. It, to keep the Sabbath is to proclaim to the world that you believe that there is a creator. Right? And, and guess what? The Sabbath is the only day of the week that has been blessed and set apart by God. He didn't bless and set apart Monday. He didn't bless, right? He didn't bless, he certainly didn't bless and set apart Monday. I got to say that again. Because Monday is not a blessed and set apart day. Uh, but the seventh day of the week is. 
and it's specifically reserved for Israel to, to uh, abstain from work. And I think that as Christians, we can certainly join in on that as well. But then we get to the story of Adam and Eve. And we find it both in chapter 1 and in chapter 2. Chapter 1 is more from an overall perspective. And chapter 2 it is more uh, uh, specific to the story of Adam and Eve and, and what happened there. But we find this in chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and, my, mu and, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. So the idea, this idea that we are all descended from the same parents and that we were all made in God's image, this served a purpose. It helped Israel to understand that there are no special human beings. And what I mean by that is over, one over another. That we are all, in God's sight, we are all equal. That there's not one group of people or one person who gets to be the ruler over others. Now, the fact that Israel later were, had kings, right? We, we started with King Saul and King David and so on. The fact that Israel had kings, if you read 2 Samuel 8, that was a concession made by God. That wasn't God's original intention. Why? Because here in Genesis, we learned that we're all equal. We're all supposed to be ruling over the earth. But it doesn't say rule over each other. And we're all made in God's image. Not one who's made in God's image and one is not. We are all made in God's image, or at least we descended from Adam and Eve who were made in God's image. Now, sin has marred that, right? Sin has marred God's image in us, that, that we're supposed to reflect who God is to the world, but Jesus never sinned, right? Jesus is the image of the invisible God, meaning as a human being, he perfectly represents God to the world. He shows us what God is like. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Right? That's what Jesus said. So Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And this ideal picture of humanity, this picture of humanity who is perfect, a perfect reflection of God, and who doesn't rule over others. Jesus is not going to, his rule, his kingdom is not going to be a tyranny. It's going to be a wonderful time, a wonderful time when God's love will transform the whole world. Now, this idea, though, this ideal picture of humanity informs the rest of the Bible, and I already just said it. It informs the rest of the Bible because it tells us that there is a time coming when we won't have rulers, where we will all live in harmony, we will all live in equality. And that's the beautiful thing that the book of Genesis paints this picture for us, giving us this image of ideal humanity, and then it shows us where we've gone wrong and how it will come back. It gives us that little glimmer of hope that it will be restored. But we should also point this out when we're talking about equality, that there is equality between men and women. The Bible teaches equality between men and women. That I don't personally believe that men and women should be exactly the same. That, that, uh, that what men do is good and what women do is good. And that doesn't necessarily have to be exactly the same things. But the point is, when it comes from God's perspective in terms of how he loves us and how he views us as in terms of our value, there is no difference between men and women. Now, I say that, but then I'm reminded of what Adam said, that as soon as he saw Eve, he said this. He poetically proclaimed this. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And have you ever thought about this? That before Eve was created, Adam didn't know he was a male, right? He didn't have this revelation or this illumination that he was male. It took him seeing Eve and seeing how she was different for him to have this revelation that I'm different too. I'm different. We're different from each other. But instead of being sad about that difference, he poetically proclaimed its beauty. And this is a key point. And I think this informs what the Bible talks about marriage, that though she was different, she complimented him perfectly. And that's the way marriage is supposed to be. We're not supposed to be exactly the same. What I bring to the table is going to be different than what Sarah brings. But, but hopefully, we're each bringing unique things so that when we come together, we are producing something amazing, right? And so I really think that informs marriage and, and, and how we are supposed to view marriage. And there's more we can share, but it is TLDR. We have to, it is too long, and we don't have the time to read it. So we're going to move, move along. 
In the Garden of Eden, from any tree of the garden, it says, you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in that day, for in the day that you eat it, from, from it, you will surely die. So the day that they eat from the tree, they will surely die. And apparently, eating from this tree would enable them to gain knowledge. But here's the key. They would gain knowledge independently from God. Because God wants us to gain knowledge, but he wants, us, wants to gain knowledge through him in his strength. Right? He doesn't want us to, to ignore him or to deny him. He wants us to do it through him. And so this was the choice put before them. And in chapter 3, we are told about the serpent that came to tempt Eve, to get her and Adam to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the text, guess what? The text doesn't tell us much about who or who the serpent was or why he was there to tempt them. And this ambiguity, this, this lack of information has caused later Christians to infer and to say that this must have been Satan, right? This must have been Satan. Guess what? The text doesn't say that. And so we can't necessarily say that this was indeed Satan. But here's the point. However you look at, look at this and understand the serpent, the, the message of the story is clear that there will always be outside influences around us trying to tempt us, trying to get us to question God's word, right? That's what the story of the serpent teaches us, is that there will always be outside influences that will get us to question God's word. The serpent got Adam and Eve to doubt God's word, right? And he influenced them in order to disobey God and to eat from the tree, that's what he did. He influenced them to, to disobey God and eat from the tree. And then after eating from the tree, Adam and Eve were then aware, were now aware of what it was like to make decisions independently from God. And guess what? They were now aware of all the negative consequences that come with that. But sadly, rather than taking responsibility for their bad choice, what did they do? The man said, the woman whom you gave to me gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. You notice what they both did? They both didn't take responsibility. They blamed the person next to them. And so this informs the overall story of the Bible because it teaches us, it teaches us that sin drives us away from God, right? Sin itself is an act apart from God, but it drives us away from God because we don't want to take the responsibility of our actions upon ourselves. We don't want to bear the shame and the guilt. And who here remembers what I've talked about recently about the cross? The whole point of the cross, or at least one powerful point of the cross, is that Jesus is our scapegoat. Our shame and guilt is on him. But instead of, instead of just being happy with that, we are convicted because he was innocent. And we want to bear that responsibility with him, right? And so we died to self with him, but in order, and then we received the wonderful newness of life as well. So as much as our sin drives us away from God, God loves us, right? That's what the cross is all about. God loves us, and he's going to do all that he can to save us. And he will always give us hope. And the book of Genesis gives us a glimmer of hope. When God was pronouncing the punishment to the serpent, he said this, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Now, this means that the serpent literally could bruise people on their heels, but human beings can stomp and crush the serpent's head. That's the literal interpretation of this, right? But Christians have always understood this to be a bit of a messianic prophecy, that this foreshadowed the, the, the coming Messiah. Because if the serpent is representative of evil forces and the seed of the woman, right, who is ultimately Jesus, represents the one who will crush the serpent's head, well, then this is a powerful uh, foretelling and, and, and image of the coming conquering Messiah who conquered sin and death on the cross, but will also conquer sin and death in the kingdom as well. And so I think that this is a wonderful glimmer of hope for us, even though we know we just lost our chance at immortality, but God is going to bring someone, a seed of the woman, a human being who will, who will bring salvation. And that, of course, is Jesus. All right, 
We're going to look now at Noah and the flood. And hundreds of years went by after Adam and Eve. And it says in chapter 6, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So guess what? This verse, uh, this is an incredible verse. It lays the theological foundation of salvation, of sin and salvation. And it really informs the message of Paul. Paul is basically quoting this when he says, the wages of sin is death. Or, or rather, uh, another verse that I, I should have put there that I, thought, I just thought of now is when he said, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's what Paul has in mind as he's writing that. He's thinking of Genesis chapter 6, where it says that, that the Lord saw the wickedness of man and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. In theological circles, that's called total depravity. And indeed, human beings are sinful, we are depraved. But I just want to give something to balance this. Because if we start thinking that we have no capacity for good, then maybe we'll just give up. But God said to Cain in Genesis, Genesis chapter 4, Sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but, God said, you must master it. Apparently, according to God, if we will trust in him, if we will work with him in his strength, we can overcome sin. So let's not buy into this idea that we are completely uh, helpless. With God's help, with God's strength, we can do it. So on our own, we are helpless. That's what the Bible teaches. It says that in, in Romans as well. But with God's strength, we can overcome sin. The story of salvation then continues to unfold before us in the book of Genesis. Because as a result of the depravity of human beings, God said this, Behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall perish. So, when we disobey God, and I've talked about this more recently, I believe that, that when we disobey God, he then removes protection, his protection from us. That he is the source of life, the giver of life, the one who is able to bring life. But when we deny him, when we, when we sin, he removes that protection, and sometimes that brings a flood. And in this case, it was literally a flood, but in our lives, it's, the, it's a metaphorical flood. But despite that, God is always going to seek to work with somebody to bring about our salvation. And that's what he did with Noah, right? Noah was a righteous man, it says. He was a righteous man, blameless in his time, and Noah walked with God. This means that Noah stood out from among the people of his day. And maybe that was easy because they were so sinful. But nevertheless, he was a righteous man, blameless in his time, and he walked with God. So God will always work with somebody. We'll work with a righteous man to do his work, to bring about his salvation. And he commanded him to build the ark and, and to gather the animals and his family and to open up the message to the whole world. And thus Noah did according to all that God had commanded him. So he did. And so this tells us that Noah was obedient, faithfully obedient. And it says this in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, by faith, Noah being warned by God about things not yet seen in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. So, Noah stands as a great example of faith. And the story of Noah, of, no, of Noah and the flood, this story informs the whole narrative of the Bible because it's a powerful metaphor for salvation, right? That God will always save those who respond to him in faithful obedience. That, that through the one who is righteous, you can have salvation from the coming flood. Right? And who is the righteous man who saves us from the flood? And that, of course, is Jesus. So Noah stands to show us, uh, you know, as a story in its own right, but also to show us what Jesus would do, how he righteously obeyed God, and uh, through him we can have salvation. Then after the flood, God promised this to Noah and to all of humanity. It says this in Genesis 9, I establish my covenant with you and all flesh shall never again be cut off by the water of the flood. Neither, neither shall there be a flood, neither shall there again be a flood to destroy the earth. So how does this, how does this promise 
inform the overall narrative of the Bible? Well, guess what? If God had destroyed humanity, we wouldn't even be here. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have God's hope, uh, the hope of something coming, the, the hope of the kingdom. So this promise that God is not going to destroy the earth again, at least not with a flood, shows us that God is not interested in destroying us. He's interested in working with us to bring about our salvation. Not that we deserve that, right? His gra- this is a gracious promise. But God is so good to us that despite ourselves, that, that our inclination is to ignore God, is to build our own kingdom. But God is going to bring his kingdom one day. But the pattern continued. Our, our inclination is to build our own kingdom. And that's exactly what happened after the flood. In the years after the flood, humanity grew in numbers and they sought to rebuild the earth. And that, that's understandable. But again, like the sin that Adam and Eve committed, they wanted to build the earth on their own without God. And what did they do? They said, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven and let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. On the surface, this seems like they just wanted to build a building and to build a city and a tower. On the surface, it might not seem like there's anything wrong with that. But guess what they were doing? They were doing it in order to do it apart from God, in order to compete with God, so to speak. And according to a Jewish tradition that I found in a commentary I read, it says this, that the people building the tower valued the bricks more than human lives. In building the tall tower, occasionally some would fall to their death, but, quote, when the people saw a person fall, they expressed no sympathy, but when they saw a brick fall to the ground, they all wept because it would take so long to get another brick to the top to replace the one that fell. That's their attitude toward human beings. This lack of value for human life coupled with their intention to compete with God, so to speak, to to go up into the heavens, right? And compete with God caused God to stop what they were doing, to confuse their languages. But it shows, this story shows us how human, human ambition, when it's left to go on its own without God's strength and without God's guidance, That whenever we try to build our own kingdom apart from God, it's going to end up in confusion and in sorrow, right? However, when we build God's kingdom, right? When we work together as Christians, when we work together to build God's kingdom, what will come about? We will be filled with God's spirit and there will be unity and there will be uh, understanding, right? As opposed to confusion, which happened to them, right? So let's have the worship team come back as we sing one last song. I want us to end our sermon, our service this morning on a celebratory note. We want, we want to celebrate the fact that Jesus is returning. So let's stand together.